Welcome to another weekend here on the platform. My name is Sam Omashe. On this program this week, I will be speaking with something rare on television, father and son displaying talent in a generation and also intergenerationally. I'm talking of Peter Ego and Tosi Ego. I am also introducing a new segment on this show called Photo Essay, where I will, take, I will talk about some rare and historic images captured many years ago. But before the lineup, my column will be read to you now. Don't cry, Mr. Godwin. The Yoruba folktale reminds one of Godwin Obaseki. It's about a swaggering elephant and the choir behind him. They tickle him with their songs of praise, the drum rolls and the dances. His head dizzy. He feels like deity in the coffee of flattery. The elephant swings right and left, forward in slow, majestic strides. We're behind you, keep dancing ahead, they reassure him. As it advances, he is not looking forward, but at himself, impressed by the finery of his apparel and the bouquet of applause. Suddenly, he reaches a precipice and falls over. Before he knows it, there is no more choir, no more drum rolls or applause, all silence. He alone, crestfallen, wounded, comically belly up. Edo State Governor Obaseki is in such grand deception. Obaseki inflicted his own woes. Why is he blaming the screening committee for lack of fairness? Did the committee ask him to get his name wrong on the NYSE certificate and made no effort to correct it? Did they ask him to make only three credits in the school certificate exam? Or did they ask for the inconsistencies in his University of Ibadan degree? By the way, I thought he attended Edo College because I saw a picture a few years ago with Unduka Obiagwena, also an old boy of Government College Ugeli, and Delta State Governor Ifan Yokoa. He presented a certificate from Ehosa Anglican Grammar School. Is it also his fault, or that of Adam Soshumole, that he lost the certificates and the court registrar could not vouch for any sworn affidavit? The issues at stake are grave for Obaseki. It's not about APC. It's about the Nigerian constitution. He's expected to present genuine certificates or evidence to INEC, and later, if challenged, to the court of law. Happily, the law doesn't expect him to have a university degree. He's supposed to scale secondary school. He might do that. That will mean he will have to contend with the issue of his NYC certificate and pray that the courts will accept that Obasek is the same as Obaseki. The avenging angels of technicality are fluttering above. It's not a matter of whether he served, but whether he served right. The law has its way of defining justice. It may be justice on the streets. It may not be in the vault of law. If Obaseki indeed did well in high school, the law did not see it. If he did well to enter the university and the law did not see it, who will see it? It's not a matter of who is on Obaseki's side or Adam's side. It's who the law sees. The constitution prevails. That's the definition of the rule of law. That's why Doye Dire is governor today and not Lyon in Bielsa State. If he decides to apply this time through another political party and does not present his certificates for university and higher school certificate and others, Obaseki will confirm the conclusions of Adams and the screening committee and make them heroes. If he presents the same papers and affidavit in another party, he will go through the same questioning that gave him the red card in APC. The worst is... If he wins in a Guba poll and has to go through the courts and meets in Napoleonic Waterloo, whether he goes to PDP or SDP or any party, he will have to contend with the same issues that have led his flatterers to cry foul. The matter will not only become a technical goblin for Obaseki, but also a moral one. Is he sincere or is he dodgy? So I ask, if he knew he had all these chinks in his ammo, why did he go to battle? If you knew you had certificate booby traps and a big mole in the eye, why dangle the dagger? 
He had seen these in the same party in Bielsa, yet it did not settle in silence. He was following the lines in scripture that says, Blessed are those whose sins are covered. His sins were covered once, and he became governor. He ripped it open of his own accord and exposed a leaky saw. This essayist painstakingly reported how efforts toward reconciliation took place between stakeholders and Obasaki. These included fellow governors, men of means, and lawyers. Obasaki would not listen. At a certain time, when all the parties gathered for him in Abuja, he had flown out of town. If he has a way out, this essayist will wait and see. Welcome back. On Big Talk today, this week, I guess are Peter Ego and son Tosi Ego. Thank you for being on this show. Peter Ego. Thank you very much. And Tosi Ego. Thank you very much for having me. I want to say Thank it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have both of you, father and son, on the show together, a rare moment of a display of talent and uh, also Idipa Grace uh, in, in Nigeria, something rare. And I want to say congratulations to you. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm also congratulating you on the award that you won in March, the multi-choice um, award for movies. Uh, uh, the father, that's Peter Ego, won for Lifetime, and the son for Picture Editor. Uh, am I right? Yes, right. very correct. Congratulations. Now, this, Thank you. this thing we are celebrating today did not start overnight. Did you, the father, see this in the song? And when did you see it? <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. No, quite. I never really saw this. But um, as you say, it didn't start today. I've been in the business of broadcasting for quite some time. But even then, it didn't start then, because a lot of what influenced me and gave me, the, if you like, the insight into what I did and what I continue to do, were born in Jos, where I was born, and growing up in Jos, um, where it was in mini Nigeria. We lived among Dibos and houses, and we were all one. And um, the cinema was a very powerful medium then. There was no television or radio, just for diffusion. And we grew up practically in the cinema. And um, watching movies from those days prepared me for understanding the moving picture and uh, fell falling in love with it and living it as I grew up. So when did you first see the spark in Tosin? Well, it's, um, it's the actually started uh, um, taking form when um, years back um, I was in Delta State and um, the governor then, uh, Governor Ibori, had invited my, un my uncle, um, Chief Boloko, for lunch and uh, both of us went for the lunch. And while we were having lunch, Ibori asked me if I had a son who was the musician. And I said, no. And I said, but some boys performed here last night. And the <laughs> first lady then, the wife of uh, Obasanjo, was um, performed. And at the end of the show, they were very impressed. And they called the boys. And one of them said, he's toasting ego, Peter Ego's son. And I said, I doubt it. I don't have a son who is a musician. <laughs> so I called my wife. And I said, come, I've just been told that. And she said, oh, you're not there. You were out on location. You, I don't sleep. Every night here, he's in his room recording with so many other boys uh, his music. And I said, is that right? So when I came back, I called him and I said, I hear you recording some music. Can I listen to some of them? And when he gave me the tape and I heard what I heard, and I said, well, let me not be the judge. Let me get some other person, judge it. So I'm not biased in my department. So I sent it to Ray Mike Machiku and also a copy to Gerald Opino. I'm sure you remember both of them. Yes, yes. And both, and both of them came back to say, did you say I recorded them in his room? And I said, yes. He said, well, one, the boy definitely has an ear for music. And two, 
He's not a good producer because what he produced is professional. So I said, oh, if that is the case. So I came back and I said, well, what do you want to do? And he said he wanted to shoot a video. And I said, okay, well, go ahead, give me a cost. And he said, gave me a breakdown that had camera, dollies, tracks, lights, and all that. And I said, I'm, uh, where did you get all this? And they said, well, I've been watching you and all that. So I provided him with the result. He shot that video, which again amazed me because he got cars from uh, so many cars from different companies, even used a private jet and all that shot there. And I said, ah, this is a great. But I said, look. So I sat him down and I said, look, yes, you've shown talent, but I don't think um, I want you to start here. Go back to school, go to university, go study more, so that when you come back, you'll be richer and you would have been taught professionally what you have exhibited here. And that's how I took him to South Africa, and he enrolled him in the film school in South Africa. The rest, as they say, is history. Okay. Tosin, you, 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 have to, you have to tell us your own version of this history, because <laughs> I'm sure you have your own take on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 it pretty much happened in that fashion, but the only difference there is that, um, what, the only difference is that um, when my, in the early days, my dad used to hire out equipment. But what he didn't know is that whenever he left the equipment and traveled, I would sneak in there, open the camera, on it, and be recording myself. I record myself singing, I record and just shoot some of things. But it, was, it, it wasn't too aware, so I got used, I got accustomed to cameras and things like that. That's because the cameras were in the house, and whenever they went out, I would come and plug them. But apart from that, everything else is still in the same fashion. Oh, that means you were sneaking in. Did you, did you <laughs> sneak in because you thought it would not approve? No, I was not just uh, sure. I knew the cameras were for rental. And my older brother was it was it tired then or to, to used to be in charge of renting the tortoise. So, and I was very young. So I was, this is I was still maybe seven, eight before even not up to eleven yet when I started going to switch on the cameras and recording. And you were recording your your, your mom probably knew about all of this before your dad. Yeah. Why? Why why did your dad why did you not discuss with your dad? That look, I love this thing and he had to know from a governor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he, no, no, that was his music aspect. That was the music, music aspect, yes. The music yeah. angle, yeah. yes. Uh, that was the music aspect years later. But I got to know later, and that's when I said, okay, well, since you are, so if you're interested, well, that's fine. I have no quarrel with that. You can continue. But I want you to be professionally trained um, in a proper film school. Mm. That's how come we now went to South no, but Africa. Uh, 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 the, issue, the issue of film and its, its capacity to be a good director and uh, to, to be on the, in the film industry, when did you first know that? You mean me? Yes. Yes, okay, when he, of course, the, when he shot the music, when I, when I listened to his music and I heard him, the, 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 the report from Gerald Pino and Ray Mike that what he had done was very, very good. And I asked him, then asked him, what would you want to do now? And he said he wanted to shoot the video. And then I said, okay, give me, tell me what you wanted. And he gave me a list of the professional camera equipment he was going to use, the camera dollies, tracks, and all that. And I said, ah, so clearly this guy knows what he's doing. But let me see how he translates this to that. And then he actually produced and directed that video, that music video. At when I looked at it and I said, "Wow, wow, wow! This is this is amazing." I mean, for a first output, uh, this was good because um, it showed you how, to show you how good it was. When I then said, "Go, let's go to you, uh, take it," when I took him to South Africa, I went to multi chores at then, and uh, one of the guys in charge of their channel, O, Cabello, I gave me a copy of the the tape he had shot, and he immediately started playing it on air. I said, this is fantastic. Yeah. And I wanted to meet who had shot this. And I said, it's my son who's going to be in South Africa. And I think they became the best of friends. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Tosi also helped me shoot a few things. Yeah. But that's when I really realized that he really had an eye for, uh, the, for details and also uh, could produce a direct. Mm. Now, Tosi, did you watch some of those programs that uh, some of us grew up on? Um, uh, yes. Like, uh, um, like uh, Samanja, Mirror in the Sun, um, Cockroach at Dawn, and so on. 
And how did those things really influence you? When did you start knowing about them and their influence on and your father's stature, you know, on, on television? No, the, the, what my dad has done was very impactful. So even at a small age, um, almost everywhere you went, you were, uh, before I knew what it meant to be Bitaigo's son, it was already being said to me. You know, before I knew the meaning of it, I read, oh yeah, Bitaigo's son, I didn't know what it meant at a smaller age, but I could tell that there was something, you know, and um, the things that impacted me, the, impacted my own generation mainly, was things like Tales by Moonlight, um, okay. and the, 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 that also, when I was growing up, I found out about Kokura Dawn, I found out about Samanja, I found out about those ones, but even the, the, the things that he was doing while I was growing up, um, shows that were being created, AM Express and those ones, those ones were also um, being seen and being, you know, uh, relevant in my time as well. But what the main truth of that is, as I'm, as I'm grown up now, and I, it mostly, like for instance, is whenever I'm in a room, although I know I'm impacted, when I'm in a room with someone who he has impacted, and they tell me, this is what your dad did for me, or this is what, so it, it, most of the time I, I still am seeing the, what he has done, I'm still seeing the effect. I'm still meeting, still working in places. And so, um, like for instance, now I'm working with, um, I'm working with someone on a, um, in Eka, this old movie, in Eka, the Pretty Serpent. So I'm directing the new one, and I find out that the producer there comes up to me and says, I, I worked for your father. And I said, how did you, and he's about just three years older than me. And I said, ah, when did you work for my father? He says, I worked for your father um, a very, very long time ago. And, and I said, okay, if, I, I, I'm just saying that, so if someone who is in my own uh, field is still telling me, that my father, you know, so it's, it's still, I'm still being affected by it. I'm still coming across um, the generations and generations of people who have been impacted and everything, even in my own generation and everything. Tell me the kind so, of conversations you had with your dad growing up about, about this profession, especially, uh, especially at the early stages. The, 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 I would say the way, um, let's say, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say we had um, conversations on um, heavy coming, but one thing that was easy and one thing my dad passed on to us is my father always told us stories when we were growing up, told stories of, um, um, I, I don't know the names in house, the giants, that baby giants, a number of, Who is of stories. So from, from this... Listening to all those stories and other stories, it gets impacted on you. On you know, you start understanding how to tell stories and how stories are um, engaged. So, in, in passing on knowledge, that's where it mostly came from. It's mostly now that I can say, "Oh, Daddy, look at this script. Look at this idea. I'm trying to do this. What do you think?" You know, um, and those those and now we have conversations on on those lines and how everything. But while while I was while we were growing up. It was more or less him discovering, oh, this boy has this eye here, this boy has that, you know, this boy has this eye here, and, you know, stuff like that. But I know definitely the storytelling, my storytelling generally came from those stories that I was told growing up. Ah, ah Peter Higo, your, your forte was television. And, yes. And uh, his forte is actually celluloid or film. Um, what would you say was actually your own legacy? That what part of your own legacy? Because you were the one that actually was central to the birth of Nollywood by by the stories of uh, your various um, um, programs on uh, NTA in those yeah. days. In those days. So, what yeah. of your legacy do you think people like Tosin are picking up? Well, the, one of the things I think uh, Joseph may not have mentioned is that the NTA family is quite big and large. And mm -hmm. um, I recall those days in the VI, when we were, uh, I was in VI, Victoria Island, the studios in VI, and they were in school, they, just next door to the studio at Drao. And every time they closed, they would come to my office and uh, sit outside or go to the studios. So everyone in the uh, premises knew them. They knew all the producers, they knew all my colleagues, they knew 
everyone. They grew up in that broadcast large family. And um, uh, so he talked about Tales by Moonlight. And of course, all the producers and the designers and all cool were all there. And they would, as they waited in my secretary's office for me, mm. while I was in the office to, before they took them home, they would discuss with them, they would mix with them and all of that. So they knew a lot of all that and saw the, if you like, the wonderful life of broadcasting mm. that they saw. And they saw how I related to people. Um, um, with respect, with politely, with friend, and all that, and how I had a free open office, people would walk come to me, and whoever came, I would listen to them and advise them on what they wanted to do. And um, it also had the reverse effect, because my elder, his elder brother, Tony, uh, who is into special effects and animation, he sets up an animation factory now. It was one of my staff who came one day, because they would sit outside in my secretary's office doing their homework or writing or doing or playing and all that, and one of them at the Tony Agetwa, who was our, who built all those props and costumes for Tales by Moonlight, who came one day to my office, saw them, chatted with them, and then walked in to tell me that, he said, you know that your son is a, a very, very gifted uh, artist. And I said, who? And he said, Tony. And that he just, she watched him draw. And each time he was drawing, he never made any mistakes. No, he was never cleaned and all that. And he, it, every line was a short stroke. And so I took notice, and that's how come years later he went into art school, film art school, and specialized in special effects and animation and uh, animation. So that is one of the legacies growing up in the uh, atmosphere and watching broadcasts and watching the actors, watching that. I think that must have also have inspired them. Okay, yeah. now. Okay, you want to say something, Tosin? I say yes, yes, that's true. We were at NCA every time from school. I, I, even in Tales by Moonlight, I, sometimes I was one of the children. Um, even in children's world, the number of shows that I would be around, okay, what, just, why don't you participate? So I was on some shows as well. Okay. As a, mm. Now, your, uh, your father's um, area has been in directing and so on and so forth, also telling to stories and writing. Yours is a little expanded. You are also a storyteller. You're also a singer. You're kind of uh, a Renaissance person in that in that regard. <laughs> why? Why do you think you have expanded that? Did you, you said you got no. storytelling from your dad. <laughs> yes. No. I think in general terms is the the way the you know how um, um, in the future a lot of things are easier. So now it's possible for me to be director and editor because the a, a cinematographer or a sound designer because now the technology is available. I'm sure if all these things were available at the time, I'm sure my dad would have. But back then, you would have needed extensive this before this. You have to shoot on the celluloid before you watch the thing. But now, while we're on set, we can see our exposure is one button. Everything is there. so a lot is easier. So once you have an idea, so it's easier for me to be able to, you know. Um, acquire the knowledge for all these um, technical places and be able to do a lot of things. So I think that is, it still comes from the same place. It's just that the technology is there and it was not there at that time. That's why I would say I can do a, a number of more things now. Yeah, you can see here in our introduction of the photo essay, a picture of Professor Wale Shuenka and his sister in 1940. Who knew and who knew that that little boy will become what he is today? So, so every little boy you see and every little child you see, there is always a Nobel Prize or a big deal in the future. Don't take them for granted. Just before the program ends, this is my poem in honor of Leah Sharibu. Raindrop, dry earth, you, Ashtaglia, have longed, like Lazarus and rich man, your tongue out just for one sip to assuage your thirst. But we all becloud the sky in this complicity of silence that has borne this terrible fruits of mother, child, and bondage. Thank you for watching the program today. You can catch up with my published column on www.samomashe.com 
Also follow me on Twitter. My handle is at Sam Omashe. And until next time, be good. <laughs>